Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Uh, levels, paddies, there, potato, 
sugarcane. So likewise, all the crops can can be put under one of these four categories. And while deciding on how the the deficit conditions can be, um, you can say. When you, when you think of the water management ultimately, these aspects will be having importance because you have to find out from where you can, you can save moisture. So all those crops which are very, um, very lowly sensitive or where sensitivity is, is very low, you can, you can let those crops wait for the moisture availability or the irrigation can be delayed in those crops and you might be in a position to, uh, to wait for the natural rain to occur or some other similar situations can be looked into. So these, these various aspects are important from that angle. So this is as far as the crops in general the behavior is concerned are concerned uh, that as what is the situation but when you talk of the individual crops every crop has some critical stages which are very important from the moisture availability point of view how do you define the critical stage of crop growth the total growth period of the crop is known starting from the sowing time to the harvest time. That is what is the total growth period. So if I know that a crop, this is the sowing time or the sowing date. And this is the time when you harvest. This total is the growth period, the crop growth period. Now this total crop growth period can again be looked at in terms of different periods of uh, uh, or different stages of growth. There are some stages which are more sensitive than the other stages. So all those stages which are having a lot of effect because of the, the moisture deficiencies are where the if the moisture deficiency is encountered, you will have the yield reduction to the maximum. Those stages are the critical stages of the crop growth. And these critical, st uh, critical st stages of the crop growth, they vary from crop to crop. As you have seen that the, the sensitivity of the crops as a whole vary from one crop to another crop. Similarly, for each crop, for each individual crop, within the crop growth period, there are stages which are which are more critical than the other stages, and the knowledge of those stages, which stages are more critical, that knowledge is again very very essential when you want to schedule the irrigation, when you want to plan the schedulings of irrigation, or in other words, to know when to irrigate. That knowledge will require this knowledge in turn that which are the critical stages and at what time of the crop growth period that stage is active. Okay. So from uh, just to give you an uh, example uh, for or before that if we try to look at which are those stages. Now these are the generic growth stages which have been identified and in all the crops these four stages you can you can in general you can see that these four stages are there as similar to uh, a human being you can see that the human beings have different stages of growth you are a child at one time in the beginning, then the adolescence starts, then you have the next stage when you are a mature man and then you are an old man. So all those stages in general 
you can you can identify similarly in the case of crops and these are those four generic stages the formative stage which are which is the early stage of growth then the the next stage is the stage of uh, rapid growth which is termed as grand growth stage and then the next stage is a stage where the flower and the fruit setting is predominant that's known as differentiation stage and maturation stage which is the ripening period and these four are the generic stages their duration will change from crop to crop their sensitivity as we have just mentioned their criticality will change from crop to crop in this categorization somehow is slightly difficult to identify or correlate it with the 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 crops in general fao which is the organization food and agriculture organization based in rome which is a body under uh, uh, the un they have uh, they have lot of uh, work which is which is being produced all over the the world they keep on compiling that work so they keep on coming out with various suggestions various methodologies which are which can be used by the agriculturists or by the irrigation or the water management people all over the world so these are the stages which have been recognized by a few so the same things but they have tried to quantify these stages slightly better than what has been done earlier <coughs> now these stages the way they are defining is the initial stage where from sowing to 10% of the ground cover when you get that is the that is the de demarcation of the spatula stage approximately again there's no and it might change from crop to crop to an extent but if you are talking in general terms these are the stages the crop development stage when your ground cover is from 10% to 70% the mid season stage when the flowering and the green setting is as we have said earlier in the case of uh, the previous nomenclature it was the differentiation stage the late season stage the ripening and harvest all these stages i uh, will later on will look at what are the variations how the the consumptive use changes when you go from one stage to another stage let's look at the some examples in some of the crops which are the critical stages where if you don't take care of the the moisture availability is going to affect the the yield of the crop so in the case of wheat the crown root initiation the flowering and the milk stage these are the critical stages in the case of maize tasseling to silking and the grain filling these are the critical stages which are identified Yes, please. The milk stage. Uh, there is a stage when the grain, in the grain, you are having uh, the milk formation before it is dried. Have you seen uh, the, the the corn or the, the 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 corn which you normally roast and eat? There you must be finding that the 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 corn uh, is having lot of uh, milk. so that is if it is a raw form you will find that the milk is the milk formation is there and uh, when it dries out then that is the time when it's totally ripe so all these uh, different uh, stages uh, people who are from the the agronomy they will they will identify all these uh, these different stages uh, they will know that what they exactly mean you can refer to any 
specific book and uh, these are quite uh, the names themselves they suggest what do they mean. For example, in the case of sorghum, flowering and the grain formation, these are the critical stages. So if you don't, if you don't uh, ensure the supply of sufficient moisture and heat at these timings, then you are going to have problems. Your uh, ultimate yield of the crop because that is what we are interested in. We are not interested in what happens in between in the crop. We are ultimately everything we are assessing with respect to the final yield. So if the yield is going to be affected, maybe that, that yield is you are only going to know about that effect on the yield ultimately when you do the harvesting. But is the yield only which, with which you can uh, assess all this impact because that is what is your interest. Whereas in the case of uh, fodder, if your uh, crop is only for uh, the function of uh, providing fodder to the animals, there the yield is fodder itself. Whereas if it is a grain crop, then the yield is the grain, that is what your ultimate aim is. If it is a vegetable crop, how much is the production in terms of the, the vegetables? So that the, the, the shape of the yield can vary, but the yield with which you are concerned with, that will be defined, that will be predefined. Okay? So it means that uh, if we look back till now, we have tried to look at all the aspects which are relating the soil, the water and the plant. These three items, these three major items which are actively involved in the overall crop production, we have looked at their interrelationships and we have done that with respect to this closed volume which is the, the closed volume of a field because from now onward we are going to look at some of the, the individual aspects in details. For example, we have, uh, uh, we have not gone into the details of what happens to the water which is spread over the, the surface. That is the next topic of our discussion, the process of infiltration. Similarly, we will also look at what happens, what are the various ways and means by which the evapotranspiration is, is uh, taking place, what are the various factors which are, which are actively involved in that process of evapotranspiration, what are the various methods by which you can evaluate the evapotranspiration. There will be another topic which we will be going into. Before we actually going for the design of the various methods of irrigation. Okay. So with that, we conclude the, the topic on soil, water and uh, plant relationships. If there are any questions, specific questions related to this topic, we can take up before we go to the next topic. Okay, then in that case, we will start with the topic of infiltration. Let me put the same slide. Again, here in this particular case, we had seen that when we apply this depth of application, the irrigation water, DA, is moving, the water is moving from this end, which is the upstream end of the field, to the downstream end. And there is some water which gets infiltrated into the soil. 
and the process of this movement. Then secondly, we also saw that because of the rainfall, because of the precipitation which is falling over the total area, there is some component of that rainfall which also gets infiltrated into the soil. So as we had uh, earlier also, we had mentioned once in the beginning and in one of the, the situations where we had tried to look at what is what is infiltration? What do we mean by infiltration? We had said that infiltration is the process of the entry of water uh, from the ground into the soil and is, is also controlling the water entry into the soil. Besides the water entry into the soil, is also controlling the advance rate of the overland flow. At what rate the overland flow will move, that is also decided by the infiltration. Because when you are letting the water, when you are letting some water move from this end of the field to the downstream end, now is a, is a case of a spatially varied flow. And the discharge is also reducing as the water is moving in the forward direction because some of some component of that water is moving into the soil. So, in all those methods, this this particular aspect, the the advance rate of overland flow, will be only applicable to those methods where you are you are having the upstream end. Uh, the entry point at the upstream end and the water flows to the downstream end. And those are the methods where you are using the cavity flow. Those are the methods which are the surface irrigation methods or the flooding methods are normally known as. But the methods where you are sprinkling water, those are not affected as far as uh, this second component is concerned, the advance rate of overland flow is not because there is no overland flow in that situation. There in the case of sprinkling, uh, sprinklers uh, irrigation, you are controlling the irrigation to the extent that there is no generation of any surface runoff. That will come to later, but uh, at this stage when we say that the advance rate of overland flow is also governed by the infiltration, we are only confining ourselves to the, the irrigation methods where we are using the gravitational flow. Let us have a look at some of the, the definitions concerning the infiltration. There are various ways by which we, we measure these or we represent the infiltration. One is in the form of infiltration rate, which we normally represent in terms of centimeters per hour or it can be any other depth unit per time unit. The infiltration rate this infiltration rate which is mentioned here is the instantaneous infiltration rate. At a particular time, what is the rate? So it can also be called instantaneous. It's instantaneous infiltration rate. So, if you want to uh, know only what is the depth at a particular time or up to a particular time, then you can represent the infiltration in the form of cumulative infiltration, which is the depth, the accumulated depth over a particular time. So, 
So this has to be over a particular time. Because this doesn't belong to instance, this belongs to a duration of the time. So in, in a particular duration, how much infiltration you could, uh, how much water has infiltrated into the soil at a particular location that can be represented in the form of accumulated infiltration, which is represented as Y, normally is expressed in centimeters or any other depth units. Similarly, another term which is sometimes used, the average infiltration rate. When you want to look at the averages over some durations, so you can always find out what is the, the accumulated depth at a particular time, what is the accumulated depth at some previous time. So within that interval, how much is the infiltration and what is the duration over which it, it has occurred. And that, that way you can always represent the instant, instead of instantaneous uh, infiltration rate, you can find out what is the average infiltration rate over some different successive intervals. So that is sometimes it is, is expressed in this form. But one thing is, is uh, there that out of these two forms, as far as the irrigation is concerned, is the cumulative infiltration which is which is more useful because at any time you are interested in how much moisture has been stored into into the soil, or in particular in the the effective root zone of the the crop. That is what you are interested in. But if you if you look at the the typical curves. This is the curve which gives the, the infiltration rate I or the instantaneous infiltration rate you can say and this is a very typical curve, the infiltration curve is also known as sometimes the infiltration capacity curve. Why it is called infiltration capacity curve? Because at any time, at any time, what you are getting, you are getting the infiltration capacity of the soil. The infiltration capacity Y is known as because that is the maximum infiltration which can take place at that particular time. And since it is a function of the soil conditions, it becomes a unique thing for the soil. For those moisture contents, the infiltration capacity will be similar. If the moisture content changes, then the infiltration capacity curve will also, or the, if, uh, for example, let me say that this specific curve is a curve when you started the infiltration at a specific moisture content of the soil. If the moisture content would have been more than that, next time when you start the infiltration or when you start creating the depth of uh, water over the top of the soil surface, the moisture content was higher than what it was at this time. Then the infiltration rate, the starting infiltration rate will be different. It might be somewhere here. It might start somewhere here. Uh, let me just uh, put that in that case, you might get something like this might become the infiltration capacity curve. So for those conditions, the infiltration capacity curve is, will remain fixed and uh, is called capacity curve because is constrained, is not constrained with the availability of water at the top. If the moisture is more than what is infiltrating into the soil at the top of the surface, then you will always be getting the infiltration capacity which will be prevalent at that particular moisture condition. If your moisture is, uh, availability is 
less than what can infiltrate, then the infiltration rate will be constrained with the availability of moisture obviously. So, in that case, it would not, it, it may not be a capacity uh, infiltration rate. It may be a rate which is less than what can happen. That is why normally when you talk of the infiltration curve, it is always the infiltration capacity curve is the maximum capacity of infiltration which is prevalent under those moisture conditions. That is, that is a very important aspect because many a times um, we will get mixed up with that. So, it is, it is because of the reason that the availability of moisture is much more than what is the, the, the infiltration rate. Now, there is another property of this that after some time if you let this, this infiltration continue, there will be a stabilized infiltration rate which will be observed and that is called sometime you also term it as basic infiltration rate. That basic infiltration rate is also the characteristic of the soil. Irrespective of where you start, with which moisture conditions you start, you will ultimately reach that stabilized infiltration rate, which represents what it represents? It represents the saturated hydraulic conductivity of the soil. So, it represents the saturated hydraulic conductivity of the soil. Now, the other curve which has been drawn here, that is the cumulative infiltration curve. So, if you integrate this, the infiltration rate curve, you will get this cumulative infiltration curve and it will be dependent on where you have started integration. What was the starting point? So, from which time to which time you are you are talking about at after in this particular case after 5 hours the accumulated infiltration is this much 20 centimeters after 10 hours is around slightly more than 30 centimeters. So, you have to look at which interval is always with respect to the, the time for which the infiltration has been taking place. And that is that is known as I'll uh, uh, introduce that term here as called infiltration opportunity time. The time for which the infiltration is taking place, or the time for which the infiltration is under consideration, that is what is the infiltration opportunity time. look at the moisture profile under ponded infiltration. How the moisture moves into the soil when you have the ponding conditions created on a dry soil. It has been observed that there are five general zones which get established under that situation and these zones are saturated zone which is 
this the top layer, the top uh, around 1.5 centimeters, a very small layer of the soil which will be under saturated conditions and the moisture content will be the saturation moisture content and in, uh, in that particular layer. Then the transition zone which is around 5 centimeters below the saturation zone and under this particular zone, this transition zone, the moisture content will be changing very rapidly. The change of moisture content is very steep, is very rapid and the next zone is the transmission zone. This is the zone in which the moisture content varies very slowly with depth as well as with time. And then you have the wetting zone where again you have a very sharp reduction in the moisture content. And the wetting zone will be having a wetting front where you can make out clearly what is the moisture. You can you can see the the change of uh, uh, moisture content actually taking place in a in a laboratory setup. You can visually see that the region where the the moisture gradient is visible. The same thing when you depict in the form of these different zones. Now, this is the soil depth, this is the soil profile, and the way it has, has been depicted is that there is a variation of water content on the x axis, which is depicted just to show that how the moisture content changes. In the case of saturated zone, uh, if this, this level is the initial water content and this level is the saturated water content, if these, between these two levels, over the profile, how the moisture content varies. Now, this is not a demarcation. You do not take it as a demarcation. This is only a, a representation of what is happening in terms of uh, these different zones, in terms of the moisture, uh, moisture content changes, that is depicted through this is not a is not a profile as such. Okay, you can see here that this in the transition zone, the change of moisture is very very steep, but this zone, the transmission zone, this is a zone which is having a very uh, slow moisture change and this zone is considerably uh, in, in terms of the, the size of the zones, this zone is the one which is having the major extent of the total um, moisture availability. And this wetting front again is not Within this, you will find that the wetting front is there after the wetting zone. You can see that how the, the wetting front is moving. This also changes with, if you keep on uh, going in for the infiltration, the extent of these zones will also vary. Now, this is only a depiction to, to uh, bring home the point that there are variations the, the moisture distribution also changes within the profile of the soil. So this can help ultimately, as you have seen the moisture extraction pattern of the, the, root, uh, the root zone. In the root zone, the moisture extraction pattern is such that the top soil is, get, is uh, contributing the maximum to the 
the availability of moisture to the plant. <coughs> Sorry. And that is the that is the the layers which needs the moisture availability more rapidly. If you can take care of that moisture availability or if you can cater to that moisture deficit without uh, without looking at the lower levels where the moisture extraction is much smaller and even if you know that the, the time which it takes, which the water takes to reach that zone is also very large. You can even ignore that, that zone when you schedule your irrigations. And that is where you can you can use all this knowledge in managing your limited resources of water and we will we'll come to that later on when we will look at those aspects. But at this juncture, this knowledge is essential to uh, at least have a complete knowledge about what happens to the moisture which is, which is uh, uh, applied onto the, the soil and it infiltrates into the, the field. The next thing which we are going to look at is that how we, what are the various methods by which you can, you can find out the infiltration characteristics of the, the respective soils. There are various methods available. For example, you can you can use numerical techniques where you can solve the, the equations analytically and uh, analytical solutions are available or you can have the, the numerical formations which can be used. But most of the times those, those uh, techniques are not, they are very cumbersome and many a times you do not have the data. In general, for irrigation um, water management, we are using the empirical relationships or some approximations to the physical processes which are used and they are, they are found to be quite reasonably good. We would like to have a look at those various uh, empirical relationships available which can be used to represent the infiltration process. These infiltration equations, <coughs> the earliest one which was uh, as early as 1932, the cost of curve equation was introduced at that time and this is the equation which represents the accumulative depth of uh, infiltration and T is the time of infiltration or the opportunity, infiltration opportunity time, so the minutes and A and B are the, the empirical constants. And the same thing you can also express in the form of uh, infiltration rate by differentiating this particular equation. The only problem in this equation was that when the time is very large, you are not, this, uh, the infiltration will tend to become zero. So you are not in a position to get the, the basic infiltration rate, <coughs> which you know that is, is prevalent. The infiltration rate which is applicable at the time when the soil becomes saturated, it stabilizes, that is a steady state infiltration rate. That is not, that is not possible in this situation. So, one way of uh, some people uh, even try to put a, a constant F0, which is the steady state rate and improved upon this specific equation. But there were other equations which have uh, come into picture and uh, they have they've also been used. One of these is Horton equation. And the Horton equation, the in 
infiltration rate is expressed with respect to the, the initial infiltration rate and the final infiltration rate, which is the F0, and a constant C. So in this particular case, you have to you have to provide what is the initial infiltration rate. So having the initial infiltration rate known, then you can find out what is the what is the infiltration rate at any specific time. Then there is another equation which is the Philip equation. Where there are two terms, one is the sorptivity term and one is conductivity term which have been used. The sorptivity term is, is more predominant in the initial portions of the infiltration curve and sorptivity is defined as as the is proportional to the moisture content at the beginning of the, the infiltration minus the saturation level moisture content. So when this, this difference will be high, S will be more predominant. Whereas in the situation when the infiltration is persistent, is, is looked at at a longer time period, this conductivity term will become more predominant. The only problem in this uh, particular case is that in many situations, this term does not represent the, the steady state infiltration rate. It might be slightly different than that. Whereas in the case of uh, sorptivity, you again you will have to give this initial uh, moisture content. So it can be it can be adjusted with respect to the initial moisture content. relationship which is quite often used has become uh, very popular at least in America is the soil conservation service equation which is nothing but is the is the approximation of uh, the, the first equation which was given by uh, Kosciko and this only this term C has been added in the Kostikov equation and this C has been taken as a constant value when your uh, uh, infiltration is in centimeters, there is another value when the infiltration is taken in inches and these constants also at the constant A it varies depending on the, the units you are using. So there are there are uh, curves. What they have done is that they have given, they have uh, constructed a number of family curves for different types of soils. So for a range of soils, they have they have constructed a range of uh, infiltration curves, which are known as they are calling it as uh, the the family of intake curves. And the number of that curve normally designates what is the what is the steady state infiltration. So the steady state infiltration represents the number of that curve. And they have also found out some approximate ways by which they can construct those curves. The, the point on Kosciko type infiltration curve at which infiltration rate decreases by 5 percent within 1 hour, that has been found out and that is taken as the steady state uh, level, the 
steady state value of infiltration that has been approximated with respect to this assumption. And if we look at <coughs> it can be represented in this form because what you are what you are saying is that you are uh, using that curve you are using this curve and this is a change in 1 hour that multiplied by dy by dt and uh, you can also find out what is the time at which the long term intake rate occurs that can be approximated by either of these two equations. Okay. Where IF is the number of soil conservation service intake family. Let me show you the, these are the various uh, intake families which have been, is it visible? These are the various intake families. You can see here, uh, this is a cumulative intake in uh, millimeters and this is the time in minutes or is the, the opportunity time. Now for each for each type of soil, for example, this is a soil which has 1.25 millimeters of steady state infiltration, whereas this is a soil which is having 50 millimeters of steady state infiltration. So all these soils, they are different soils and these are known as the family curves. Once you know these family curves, then you can always find out, knowing the opportunity time, you can always find out how much is the accumulated infiltration. Now, the method of uh, measuring infiltration in the field, you use cylinder infiltrometer. This is a very simple equipment is a set of two cylinders, concentric cylinders, an inner one and an outer cylinder which are used to absorb the infiltration rate. Now these cylinders earlier to start with a few look at this, there was only single cylinder which was used for this purpose. This cylinder is driven in the soil and then you put some known quantity of water and take the observations on that change of level with respect to time. Now, what was the problem was that the infiltration was taking place, there was a lot of movement of moisture in the lateral direction because of the fact that the soil in this zone the soil which is in this area this was having less moisture content so there was a deficit of the moisture content in this uh, adjoining soil a lot of water has had a tendency to move in the lateral direction. Because of that, it was not representative of what should have moved if the water was available in throughout the field. So because of that, to avoid that uh, loss, the two concentric cylinders were used, in which case you will still have the same tendency that some water will be moving from this area into the lateral direction, this tendency will still be there, but most of the water which is coming from the inner cylinder will have the vertical movement. 
So all that, the additional amount of moisture which is going in the liquid direction is coming from the outer cylinder which is not part of the, the, the cylinder where the observations are being made. And these are the dimensions as the two cylinders are, the inner one is 30 centimeters diameter, the outer cylinder is 60 centimeters diameter and uh, you, um, you have uh, the depth of this, these cylinders is around 25 centimeters and is driven into the soil up to around 10 centimeters. So if you look at the various uh, steps which are uh, performed while making these cylinder infiltrometer uh, readings, these are the steps which also include the various other operations which you have to start, uh, which you have to, which you have to uh, take before you lay the, the, the cylinders in the field and also before you start observing the, the various readings. These steps include the level of the ground, the level the ground, clean the surface so that there is no, no uh, uh, undulations in the surface itself because at times you, you would like that throughout this uh, area the level of water is uniform, though it is a very small uh, area which you are covering through the cylinders. Then you derive both these, the inner and then the outer cylinders up to a depth of 10 centimeters in the soil. You will have to fix a hook gauge which will be used to make the measurements or record the levels of water in the inner cylinder. So for that purpose the hook gauge will be installed. You will have to place the plastic sheets as when you pour the water you want the, the observations to be taken with respect to time. So when you are pouring the water if you are not ready you will like the, the, the water to stay and for that purpose you will like to use the plastic sheets so that you can start the time when you start the observation. Pour water in the cylinders up to a depth of around 12 centimeters and this has to be done in both the cylinders. So there is no connection in, uh, between the two cylinders. You will have to put the known quantities of water in the inner cylinders but as far as the outer cylinder is concerned you should maintain approximately a similar level in the outer cylinder also without making any observations. Record initial reading on the hook gauge, then the next step is that lower the gauge to 1 to 2 centimeters depending on the soil. If the soil is a very light soil, the infiltration rates will be very high. So then in that case, you, you can adjust the, the gauge up to a level which may be higher level, maybe 2 centimeters because it will it'll take very small amount of time to reach that level. Remove the plastic sheet and start the stopwatch because you want to observe the, the time when the infiltration starts taking place. Note the time when the level reaches the hook gauge. That means you have, you had set the, the known difference of level, how much time it takes to reach that level. That is what you have observed. Lower the hook gauge further by a known depth. Repeat the above steps till depth in the cylinder is reduced to around 7 centimeters. So you are trying to be within a range which is from 7 to 12 centimeters and after you have reached this uh, depth of around 10, uh, 7 centimeters, you can add measured quantities of water so as to replenish the depth up to around 12 centimeters again. So that is, that is what is the procedure. The whole procedure is geared to uh, record the movement of moisture in the soil with respect to time. That is what is going to give you the rate. That is one way. There, there is another possibility also and 
this case, you are trying to find out the time which is taken uh, for the water to move a known depth of quantity of water into the soil. You can do the other way around. You can uh, keep on um, taking the readings at a regular interval and then find out what is the depth at that particular time. So in any case, ultimately you are going to find out. The, you, can, you can make a plot where you can uh, transfer these observations and then use that to find out what is the accumulated infiltration depth curve. So that is, the, that is this procedure which is very simple and uh, that is what is observed. Only thing is that you should uh, try to ensure that the, the depth uh, is approximately between these limits because uh, in actual practice, when you are uh, using the actual irrigations, the range is almost similar. The irrigation also varies from this uh, 7 centimeters or 5 centimeters to around 10 centimeters or 15 centimeters, depending on again uh, the type of soil, which will, will come to those things later. And uh, secondly, you can make these observations at different locations in the field so as to take the average value because there might be some variation in the soil type. Okay. So with that, we'll uh, uh, conclude this topic and I'll give you a tutorial sheet which will give you some practice on what type of data, uh, some, ex some exercises which you can use, those exercises based on uh, the actual data which has been collected over the field and then you can try to use those, uh, the, those data to, to uh, get an infiltration curve.